we must move on to questions to the Minister for Social Development. Please note that questions 6, 9 and 14 have been withdrawn. We will start with listed questions and I call Mr Ross Hussey. Mr Hussey. Question 1, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, following the Storm and Castle Agreement on Welfare Reform in December 2014, an amendment was tabled to the Northern Ireland Welfare Bill uh, which made provision for a pilot scheme to be carried out in advance of personal independence payment going live in Northern Ireland. This was passed by the Assembly at the consideration stage of the Bill's passage and since then my officials have been actively working to put in place the arrangements to implement this commitment. Uh, this has included mapping the process by which potential participants for the pilot could be identified, discussions with DWP about the early deployment of the personal independence payment IT system, and engagement both with Capita Business Services, who will provide the personal independence payment assessment service, and other key stakeholders to ensure a successful and meaningful personal independence payment pilot. Given the key purpose of the pilot uh, was to help inform plans for personal independence payment rollout in Northern Ireland, and the actual commencement of the pilot was always linked to establishing a definite and a definitive date as to when uh, personal independence payments would be introduced. As the Welfare Bill did not complete its legislative passage through the Assembly on the 9th of March, the work which is needed to prepare for the implementation uh, on the changes, including the personal, implement, uh, personal independence payment pilot, has had to be stopped. Mr Hussey for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. And I know and we all know of the problems that we are facing in view of the uh, political intransigence that we are facing in relation to uh, welfare reform. How quickly do you think, if the legislation gets passed, we will be able to move to have this uh, uh, my head's gone blank, pilot scheme uh, in place? Well, obviously, and the member is absolutely right in relation to the intransigence and the uh, lack of decision on this particular issue uh, and uh, I will have more probably to say about uh, that particular issue as we make our way through uh, the question time. In terms of the anticipated time scale, I would trust that uh, when we would have the uh, completion of the uh, welfare bill as far as the processes in the House is concerned, that we could start immediately to engage in the work that we have set out in the substantive answer that we have given. And I would trust that over a period of months that we could see progress in relation to the pilot. But I will ensure that, uh, subject to what happens in this House next Tuesday, that the members kept informed. Call Mr Trevor Clark. The Deputy, oh, sorry, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for the question? And I know this has veered into welfare reform more directly. And, uh, and we're all familiar now that you have laid for next week in relation to that legislation coming to the House. Can you inform the House then the consequence if this actually doesn't get a resolution by next week in relation to welfare reform or indeed the rest of your department? I thank the, the member for his supplementary. And as we know, the welfare bill did not complete its legislative passage through the Assembly as scheduled on the 9th of March. Uh, this further delay in the bill receiving royal assent has meant that the work which is needed to prepare for implementation of the changes uh, has had to be brought to a conclusion. This continuing delay uh, has been for me and for uh, many, I believe, frustrating, not only for those involved in delivering social security or even for those who advise claimants on their rights, but more importantly, on the thousands of people across Northern Ireland who are now becoming totally confused as to what changes will be brought in by the Bill and how these changes will impact upon them. And let's be under no illusion. And let's not try to paint some narrative here in the House today that somehow there's, there's a bit of smoke and mirrors going on, that there's something happening that is being choreographed, that somehow uh, something else is happening in the shadows of uh, other buildings beyond the confines of, of this chamber. Let me spell it out very clearly and very plainly. And if we fail next Tuesday, as I table today at the Business Committee, my intention to bring back again for final stage the welfare uh, bill, if that falls, 
it will have serious repercussions for Northern Ireland. It will have serious repercussions for uh, the, the people of Northern Ireland and also, I believe, will have serious repercussions for the long-term sustainability and the future of the institutions which we are currently engaged in. Let us not be under any illusion. We are at a very serious uh, uh, juncture. We have run out of road and very soon we are going to run out of money. And I think that should focus the minds and the attention of every member in this House till we find a solution to this problem, which has been around for far too long. Call Mrs. Joanne Dobson for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, as Minister for Social Development uh, and lead responsibility for relationships with the voluntary and community sector, I am fully aware of the funding pressures faced by the sector. The voluntary community sector is seen as a key social partner of government uh, as we build a participative, peaceful, uh, equitable and inclusive community in Northern Ireland. As you are aware, the strain on the public finances in 2015-16 has been considerable, and this has impacted upon the financial relationship between government and the sector. When finalising the budget for my department, I instructed my officials to ensure that resource allocation decisions being made across the department be prioritised, that they were transparent, accountable and that they were evidence-based. As Minister, I fully recognise the role that the voluntary community uh, sector carries out in delivering so many necessary public services on behalf of government and the impact that the reduced resourcing can have on these vital services. I also fully recognise the significant contribution made by the VSC to economic and social activity in Northern Ireland. And like all government departments, uh, my department is a signatory to the concordiate between the voluntary and community sector and the Northern Ireland government, and successful implementation of this agreement requires real and recognisable commitment across the public sector. And the member will be aware that no later than yesterday uh, in this House we had a debate in regards to this issue, and the challenge that came as a result of, of that debate was that uh, we all collectively, and we, we very often in this House use phrases and terminology, but sometimes it fails to relate into practice beyond the confines of this chamber. But the challenge following on from yesterday's debate collectively to ministers, to the executive and this assembly is to ensure that not only by word but also by deed we demonstrate the value that we believe the voluntary community sector delivers in our society. I can remind the Minister gently about the two minute rule. I call Mrs Dobson for a supplementary. Um, can I thank the Minister for his um, comprehensive answer? And at present, the combined cross cutting effect is not being considered. So, following, as you mentioned, yesterday's debate, will you now ensure that this issue is brought back to the Executive so that all Ministers are made fully aware of the impact across the, the departments? And furthermore, would he agree with me that there should be transitional funding made available to this sector so they no longer fall um, foul to government decisions? Yeah, I thank the member for a supplementary. And on the basis of the, the, the last point in relation to a transitional fund, I uh, met with uh, the uh, representatives from NICVA just a few uh, days ago. Uh, and one of the issues that was raised at that meeting was the issue of a transitional fund. I subsequently now written to uh, OFM, DFM, uh, setting out that uh, particular issue, and I continue to uh, engage with OFM, DFM, and obviously the follow-on from yesterday's debate will now be uh, part and parcel of the review that has been undertaken by the two junior ministers uh, in OFM, DFM, and. I have, as uh, outlined, responsibilities as the Minister for the Community and the Voluntary Sector, given my assurance that I and my officials will continue to engage in this process. Because if, if we don't, and this is, uh, I think this is the reality for us, and I have seen this, as I said yesterday, in my own constituency, and many members, if not all, 
can relate this across their own constituencies. That we all know of organisations that if they do not find a financial resolution to the particular problems that they are in, that they will uh, either have a greatly reduced service or they will disappear altogether. And the challenge for statutory, uh, for government agencies then will be the cost of picking up that service. I think we need to bear that in mind and that ought to be to the forefront of the decisions that we have to make, all being always mindful of the very difficult, very challenging financial circumstances that we find ourselves in, which is a challenge for every minister and for this assembly. Call Mr. Alex Maskey. From Maggot, people asking the court, could I ask the minister to partly address this in his first response? But could the minister outline maybe perhaps a little bit more detail how he, in fact, has sought to alleviate the difficulties, uh, particularly in related to your uh, neighbourhood renewal area-based projects? Yeah, I think the, the member. Uh, and this was, for me, one particular issue that uh, I found challenging in terms of how the, the process operates. It would be very easy for me to have just simply uh, top sliced, uh, given the hand that I had been given in relation to the budgetary process. In fact, the, the situation in DSD even became uh, more bleak because, following on from further discussions, the, the budget was further reduced. Uh, and that created a particular difficulty for us. However, there was uh, a process that was engaged in. In fact, I have encouraged organisations who have felt that they could not fully uh, accept the way in which the, the budgetary process had been handled to come in and to have discussions with us so that they are clear as to the rationale that we used. And I trust that that rationale was transparent, that it was fair, that it was equitable, and uh, it was done in a way which at least there was justification. If there ever can be justification for being in the position whereby you had a certain amount of money last year and it is now reduced, uh, but that's the reality of where we're at, and I think that that process is a template. It's not perfect. Uh, it probably has uh, flaws in it, but I think that there was clearly a genuine attempt made by us to ensure that we address this issue. Also in the light, and this is the other uh, point that we need to bear in mind, that I was also very uh, cautious and very uh, cognizant of the fact that come next year, these funds will transfer to local councils, and it will then be the responsibility of local councils to determine and decide how those monies are spent and the priorities that they give. I call Mr. Paul Girvin. Thank you, Minister, for his answers <coughs> thus far. Um, in relation to uh, the responsibility that his department have for the voluntary and community sector, what assistance or help is being given? to those organisations that are uh, probably uh, uh, impacted by uh, the efficiency savings that they have to target over the next number of years? Yeah, I think the member really follows on from what, what I was saying uh, to the, the previous question and, uh, or answer that I gave. And, and what we have sought to do is by the process that we have used uh, in terms of trying to mitigate uh, as far as we possibly can. And we've done that by prioritising as far as possible funding to support the sustainability of the voluntary community sector and for key services such as generalist advice services, the neighbourhood renewal, supporting people, uh, volunteering and women's uh, child care fund. And we'll closely uh, liaise with as we have said, the junior ministers, uh, as they undertake the impact of the review. And I also intend to continue to have a discussion uh, with NICVA on these issues because they play an important role as a conduit. Obviously, uh, as I made reference to yesterday, we have the joint forum, uh, which uh, I have attended and have tried to set out for the forum our programme and our priorities. Uh, they had their meeting. Uh, recently, and there was one issue on the agenda, and uh, that clearly focused the minds of those many organisations which are part and parcel of the forum. And also, and I'll, I'll bring members back to the issue. I know it may only be in paper, but it ought to still be in practice, and that is the issue of the Concordia. That is a commitment by government as to the way in which they will respect, work with, and endeavour to understand the problems that are faced by the community and voluntary sector. <coughs> Well, Mr. David Hilditz. Deputy Speaker, question three. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
the Housing Executive has advised me that the issue of abandoned cars is in fact on private property and is not on Housing Executive land in Taylor's Avenue. Uh, it was raised at the Carrie Fergus Antisocial Behaviour Forum meeting in March this year, uh, and it was agreed that the Police Service of Northern Ireland the Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, uh, formerly the Carrick Fergus Borough Council, uh, as the most appropriate agencies uh, that would take action in relation to this issue. Call Mr. Hildes for supplementary. Thank you, Deborah Speaker, and I appreciate the Minister's answer. Uh, on a general issue, what steps are the Department taking to address antisocial behaviour in areas of social housing? I think that uh, there is clearly a challenge for all in terms of this particular issue and, and what we face uh, in Carrick is no different than what is faced in many other uh, parts of Northern Ireland. And in terms of what the Department uh, endeavours to do to address the problem of antisocial behaviour, I think you could look at it in two parts. First of all, as the Department, we provide the policy and the legislation to support, to help the housing executive and other social landlords to deal with antisocial behaviour. And that is currently uh, being developed in terms of proposals for new legislation designed to facilitate the sharing of information about antisocial behaviour, because I think that there is a concern that many have that what we currently have in place isn't robust enough to be able to deal with issues in a, an effective way and in a timely way, because many of these things uh, go on for a long period of time. The Housing Executive has as well developed a system for tackling antisocial behaviour based on the written strategy, and that's currently being updated, which sets out their objectives uh, and their uh, priorities. So there is a number of elements that is entailed in terms of what we can do, what the housing executive can do, but ultimately this is an issue which society has to endeavour to address. And I trust that uh, in the areas where there is uh, a considerable focus around this issue, that people realise that they are bringing uh, to their own community, uh, a reputation which is ill-deserved and is certainly not warranted by the greater majority of the people who want to live in settled communities and live at peace with their neighbour. Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I declare an interest in this subject area, as I had previously provided court e evidence, which uh, resulted in an ASBO order being awarded against an individual in this area who had. Uh, been linked to over 90 cars being abandoned in the Taylor's Avenue area. But can the Minister advise whether or not that antisocial behavioural order still applies? And what action the Northern Ireland Housing Executive has taken uh, to invoke the tenancy agreements of occupants of Taylor's Avenue who may be con continuing to contribute to abandoned vehicles in the area? I yeah, thank the member for uh, for his, his contribution and declaring uh, his particular interest in this, this particular issue. Obviously, he makes a valid point, particularly around the issue of the housing executive. And the housing executive's non statutory interventions, as we've said, <coughs> includes uh, warning letters, acceptable behaviour contracts, mediation, uh, and community support. In addition, the housing executive is one of the founding partners and participants, along with the PSNI and local councils, in the Antisocial Behaviour Forums, which meet to discuss the antisocial behaviour in nearly every council area. They have uh, 57 neighbourhood uh, officers who contribute to making their estates cleaner and safer places to live. And the Housing Executive contributes funding to a number of local schemes to address the crime and fear of crime in the area. In terms of the specific around uh, what is mentioned in Carrie Fergus, uh, when the member raised this as uh, a question, it certainly brought focus and attention to me that this was a particular area when we then looked into the detail of it has been going on for some considerable period of time. And following on from uh, today's uh, question time, I endeavour my intention would be to get a, a further update from the housing executive as to what further steps they are going to take to ensure that we can have an effective outcome in relation to this. And when I have that information, I will share it with the members who have raised concerns. Well, Mr. Fergal McKinney for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. 
Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Already 328 households have benefited from the provision of energy efficiency measures delivered through the Affordable Warm Scheme. And my department has a public service agreement uh, target to assist at least 9,000 uh, households with energy efficiency measures uh, and has can, uh, obviously in the past we have consistently exceeded those targets and I am confident that that will be the case again in 2015-16. Mr McKinney for supplement. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I can thank the Minister for his reply. Uh, could I ask him though however does he share my concern at the uh, time delay from the date of referral to the implementation of the measures as assessed and what plans does he have to monitor and improve uh, outcomes for constituents? Yes, I think that uh, when it comes to any of these particular schemes, and, and obviously we have uh, a particular issue here in that we move from one scheme to another scheme, and any transition is always difficult, we continue to liaise uh, with the councils and uh, to ensure that they are working in a way which is uh, eff effective and efficient in relation to the timescale, but also in terms of their ferals, in terms of the quality of what is, is going on in, in this particular scheme. And it is something that I am particularly interested in, given that uh, other colleagues in this House uh, have written to me uh, over a period of time raising particular concerns. And uh, we have had some correspondence in relation to individual cases where there has been some delays. And I am uh, obviously uh, concerned that that could become more. I don't think it has started to grow in terms of numbers, but when you have a situation where there is a process, where there are referrals, you could have some delays, and I will endeavour, as will all those involved in the Affordable Warm Scheme, to make sure that those are kept to a minimum and that this remains an effective and an efficient way of dealing with, with a, what is a very important issue that has to be addressed in our homes. Call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could I ask the Minister, in, in his estimation, um, are the new Super Councils ready to deliver the Affordable Warm Scheme? Thank the Member. And, and, and in a sense, it follows on from what I was saying to, to the previous uh, Member. And while the Affordable Warm Scheme is at an early stage, uh, it has already, I think, been effective in delivering across all council areas. And my officials have been working with council staff uh, for over two years to pilot and develop the affordable warm scheme. So there was a number of, of issues that were uh, highlighted in terms of the pilots, which now I trust can be easily addressed in terms of the rollout of the scheme. Each of the councils assigned a service level agreement uh, with the department, demonstrating their commitment to delivering the new scheme. And all councils have appointed a coordinator and support staff for the scheme. Uh, officials from the department uh, would meet regularly with the lead council officers to monitor progress, receive feedback and provide additional support where necessary. And indeed, it is my intention to take some time, uh, if uh, we have time, uh, some of us may have more time in our hands maybe after next week uh, than we imagined. Uh, however, we will deal with that as it is. But uh, clearly, uh, what I want to do is I want to go out and visit some of the schemes and actually see in a practical way uh, what is being delivered, what it really means to our constituents and to the people, and how that this uh, scheme is being effective in what it was originally intended to do. And that's what I want to ensure happens as a result of this particular scheme. Call Mr Basil McCree. Uh, could the Minister tell me if the Affordable Warm Scheme has any mechanism for self-referral? In terms of the, there is a, a mechanism in terms of uh, self-referral, and maybe I could just uh, outline that uh, to uh, the member. The Affordable Warm Scheme offers a range of insulation and heating measures to improve efficiency. Energy efficiency, low income households, and those include loft insulation, cavity wall insulation, and new heating uh, systems. The person can refer themselves, they can make contact with the council, and also the council can, if they believe someone should be referred to the scheme, can also make reference in terms of an individual. Call Ms. Rosalie McCorley. Um, Thank you, uh, 
translation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would assume that that was question number five. Thank you. Uh, you will be aware that it is the housing executive's role to assess housing need and formulate and manage the delivery of the social housing development programme. I have recently approved the three-year gross social housing development programme covering the period of 2015-18. For the West Belfast parliamentary constituency, the programme currently comprises a total of just under uh, 1,200 units, 1,191 to be precise. At this early stage in the programme, it is hard to be precise about the delivery times and the final numbers. As you will appreciate, schemes can slip or be lost from uh, a particular programme given uh, for a variety of reasons, such as difficulties achieving planning permission uh, and others can be added in uh, to new uh, as opportunities would arise. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And can I ask the Minister, uh, can he give us some detail on any available land in West Belfast that has been zoned for housing but has yet to be applied for? Well, obviously, uh, one of the areas which has uh, had considerable degree of interest is in relation to uh, the Vistian site uh, and obviously Fold Housing Association plan to take forward the development of the Vistian site during this financial year subject to planning approval. Uh, this is an important scheme which would meet a significant amount of housing need and I would urge all uh, in the chamber to, to be supportive. Uh, my department is fully supportive of mixed use tenure developing uh, uh, in terms of this particular uh, type of development. The, in areas where the uh, land is being uh, identified, uh, housing need is identified, housing associations are encouraged to look out for potential sites for development. Land supply is a key constraint to building more in West Belfast. Housing associations are doing all that they can uh, to identify and to buy land in the area. They are supported in this by my department and the housing executive through the programme of advanced land purchases. However, securing land in areas of high demand such as West Belfast remains very challenging and opportunities that do arise such as Vistian need community support. So there are also uh, a case for building a higher densities in West Belfast and other areas of high demand. And if there is support for this, it is an issue that my officials will continue to explore. Call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister clarify how housing need is assessed? Is it all about waiting this whether it's for the specific area, whether it be West Belfast or indeed North Town? <laughs> uh, I'm always. Uh, impressed by how members can be inventive when it comes to moving from West Belfast to North Down. Uh, but in terms of the specific in relation to how is housing need identified and addressed, the housing executive is responsible for assessing the level of social housing need and determining the need for schemes in specific geographic areas and formulating the social housing programme. The housing executive carry out an annual housing needs assessment of all uh, council areas in order to examine uh, the supply and demand for new social housing. This assessment is then used to determine the housing executive's unmet housing needs prospectus, which identifies locations where there is general unmet housing need beyond the schemes included in the social housing development programme and where there has not been possible to secure new build sites. Housing need is identified by number uh, deemed to be in housing stress. This is where applicants have 30 points or more on the housing executive's housing selection scheme. Housing needs in Northern Ireland is addressed through the social housing development programme in a fair and equitable way. I want to say this in answer to the member as well, that, that much has been achieved in addressing housing need, but there is no doubt that there, the serious financial challenges that we face moving forward will make this an increasingly difficult task. However, the delivery of social housing will remain a, a priority, and I was delighted just uh, last week to be able to uh, announce that in terms of the target that we had set, 
in terms of social and affordable homes, that we have exceeded that target which was set at 8,000 homes and it is over 10,000. And yes, you know, the, there are many, the naysayers, who will want to always say, but it should have been 12,000, it should have been 15,000. However, for those people who are in those homes today, Minister's it is, is up. for them an improvement and for them and it is an advancement and I want to build, excuse the pun, I want to build on that success. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions and I call Mrs Joanne Dobson. Mrs Dobson. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give this House um, his assessment on the effectiveness of Housing Executive Points Scheme and whether he has any plans to review or amend the system? I thank the, the member for the, the question. And obviously, this is an issue which has gone round the rounds. It is a, a contentious issue. It is an issue that has been uh, about for a long period of time about how we allocate uh, houses. And, and the member, as other members will know, and I know well as a constituency MLA, that in terms of the allocation system, there are those who believe that it is an unfair system. There are those who believe that it is a fair system. We have many different. Uh, approaches, and it all depends on the experience that the individual has when they go into the housing executive or through <coughs> other agencies to acquire uh, a uh, allocation. It is something that is uh, under review. It is something that we will, I no doubt, have challenges as to how you get what is an objective and fair system, because whatever system you would put in place in terms of a points allocation. There are, unfortunately, Mr Deputy Speaker, there are those who will try to find an inventive way, and some of those ways are, are not very wholesome, but ways of getting round that to ensure that they have more points than the reality is in terms of their particular needs. Call Mrs Dobson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister again for his comprehensive answer. Would you agree with me a system which awards, as well as under circum certain circumstances, removes points would be a fair way of ensuring that the housing executive properties are allocated to those in the greatest of need and indeed the most deser deserving? And furthermore, does he agree that those with a connection to a particular area are given extra points to improve community cohesion in um, our local communities? I think it's always difficult when you start to remove something from people. Uh, and, and obviously, you need to have a, a very good uh, basis uh, for. Let, let's remember that that process commences when someone goes into the housing executive and when they uh, are endeavouring to have uh, a points assessment carried out. And you need to have some very uh, substantial and some very good reasons as to why. It, not that you would remove points, but that you wouldn't allocate points. And obviously, uh, and I have seen this uh, in my short time, and maybe will even be shorter, depending on what happens in the next number of days uh, in this job, is that when you do have good housing and when you have settled tenants, you contribute to the community. You make an invaluable contribution, which I think is something that we all strive for as members, and we all have areas in our constituency where there has been difficulties and challenges. And I can think of one estate in my own constituency where a number of years ago uh, people did not want to live in that particular location, but because there was a proactive approach taken, there was intervention. Today that uh, development has a waiting list, and the, the tone and the way in which people live in that community has been greatly enhanced, and I think we are all beneficiaries as a result of that. Call Mr. Colomies to defer topical question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? Uh, given the, the, the coming transfer of urban regeneration and what will be the, the closure of the North West Development Office, can the Minister tell us what will become of the 44 staff uh, that are currently employed there? I you know, thank the, the member for raising the, the particular issue, and obviously this is a matter of uh, concern to him uh, as uh, a constituent MLA. And, and he's right; the regeneration bill currently progressing through the assembly provides the legislative basis 
for the Department for Social Development to transfer the urban regeneration and community development powers uh, to uh, local government from the 1st of April 2016. As Department transferring powers rather than functions, no compulsory transfer of DSD staff uh, to local councils. Staff exercising uh, urban <coughs> regeneration and community development powers uh, to transfer to local government will become surplus when uh, these powers transfer. And these uh, staff uh, in the Department's Urban Regeneration and Community Development Group uh, include the 44 staff in the North West Development Office, and the staff will be redeployed in line with the Northern Ireland Civil Service Redeployment Policy. The voluntary exit scheme and subsequent redeployment opportunities will be the means by which the surplus in the North West Development Office will be managed. And can I just say, in conclusion, in relation to that uh, issue, I want to pay tribute to those staff in that particular office, indeed to all my staff in the development offices, but particularly uh, what they have done and achieved in the city. And I know from working with many of the organisations and the feedback that we have received, uh, it is appreciated and it is valued, and certainly their, their contribution to the city has been something which has been of worth and has been something which has been recognised. Split for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister uh, for his answer? Can I join with him in paying tribute uh, to those staff? But can I appeal to him, uh, if possible, that he works with his uh, executive colleagues to ensure that those staff who want to be redeployed can be redeployed within the city or, or surrounding areas? We do have a very real unemployment uh, crisis in our city, and uh, losing jobs is not something that we need to be acquiescing in. Thank you. Yes, it is something that I am very conscious of, and I have alluded to the, the framework that we have to work within in the sense that we have the Northern Ireland Civil Service redeployment policy. I am very conscious of uh, the fact that we want to, uh, as far as we possibly can, ensure that uh, staff uh, are located in areas that is suitable and, and areas the travel to work issue obviously is a concern for members who are currently or staff who are currently employed in the London Dairy area. I will endeavour, as we have done, I think, in relation to other issues in the city, to be very conscious of the fact of the employment challenges that are in the West and in that particular location. And it's something that I will continue to give. Uh, an importance to, and uh, if there is any further developments in relation to that particular issue, I would be quite happy to keep the member informed. Call Mr. Fram I have got a last kind of call, and I thank the minister for his uh, answers of tonight. But I would ask him: is, uh, Could he give me an update on where the uh, the, the tar black strategy rests at present, uh, and if there is any, any delay? Well, I thank the, the, the member for his uh, question. This is an issue which I think uh, is uh, and continues to be for me uh, a particular concern. Uh, I have had uh, some discussions with uh, the chair and the chief executive of the housing executive uh, in relation to this matter. Obviously, Members will be aware that uh, there is one uh, scheme that is currently uh, being progressed, uh, and members will see that uh, as they, they make their, their way along the West Link. But obviously, we have a considerable number of tar blocks in Northern Ireland in different locations, and there are decisions that we will have to make uh, in terms of where we go with housing generally and the long term issues. And I, I believe exciting plans and proposals that I trust we will be able to develop in the weeks and months ahead around uh, housing in Northern Ireland. But one particular issue that will need a very specific piece of work done, and that is around the issue of tar blocks. And indeed, I have a meeting with the housing executive, I think it is either next week or the following week, uh, and that is one of the issues that is on the agenda. Thank you, last comment, Corley. And I thank the Minister for, for, for his answer. Uh, uh, the, I had heard that there, were, there, there was some delays in uh, the strategy coming through, uh, and that raises some serious concerns uh, for, for people who live in tar blocks uh, that live with poor heating, leaking windows, leaking roofs, and many ser other serious problems uh, that uh, 
that, that pe people face in high rise living. And that can assure me uh, that, that, that not only will it be investigated, but that there will be a proper strategy to deal with these problems in future. Yes, I would like to see, as uh, I would on a number of issues, there be uh, progress made. Uh, I'm well aware, in fact, just uh, last week we had a petition that was uh, handed in both to the Housing Executive and to uh, the Department around concerns that have been raised in Rathcool uh, on particular issues there. Uh, and I've asked the Housing Executive, as the organisation, the lead body, in terms of how to deal with that issue, uh, to give us an update. And that all will feed in to where we go with this particular issue. Because uh, I am very conscious that there are uh, people who want to use this as a divisive issue, uh, and they will look at it as, well, you are doing work in that particular location, but you're not doing work in this location. And so I want to ensure that what we do within the limited and the finite resources that we have, that we will address the problem in a way which is fair to as many as we possibly can. But I, I would say this to the House. There will be a challenge for us uh, in the coming weeks. There is one coming for us all on Tuesday, but there is another one, and that is around where we take housing in Northern Ireland. And the member will be aware that there has been a stoop condition survey carried out by Savills, and I have now receipt of that particular report, and very soon I will be sharing that report with his colleague and yourselves on the DSD committee. And that will clearly indicate to us the magnitude of the problem that we have in relation to addressing the needs within the current housing executive stock. And clearly, the challenge for us will be, how do we fund all of this? How do we secure the funding to ensure that we continue to give to the people that we represent the best possible quality homes? And I've repeatedly said this in this House. This is not about houses. Members, two minutes. This is time. about homes. Call Mr Jim Wells. As the member minister will know, the, uh, Newcastle is welcoming the Irish Open Golf Tournament uh, within the next few days. Uh, what steps have his department taken to facilitate and to deal with the huge pressures that will be placed upon the Newcastle and South End communities as a result of that very welcome development? I uh, thank uh, Mr Wells for his, his question, his continued interest in his constituency, and, and also uh, to say that we are glad to, to see our, our colleague with us, and we continue uh, to have him in our thoughts and prayers and ask him to pass on to his wife our thoughts and prayers yeah. at, at this time. And also, I think, uh, when he has mentioned the issue of golf, uh, to pass on our congratulations uh, to Rory Michael Roy, who yet again at the weekend did us all proud, and uh, someone that Northern Ireland uh, is uh, immensely proud of, and uh, only one can wonder at his skill in terms of playing golf. But my department has provided funding of some £250,000 towards a £287,000 revitalisation project in Newcastle. The re uh, Newcastle revitalisation scheme sought to build upon the award-winning public realm scheme by introducing the new public art, creating additional attractions, uh, covered outdoor event space, the bespoke uh, Christmas lighting and a new marketing and promotional campaign to promote the area. In addition, uh, in particular in relation to what has been done in regards to the Irish uh, Open Golf Championship that is going to be held there in May, we recently approved uh, funding of uh, £21,500 to help Newcastle prepare. Uh, and an important factor in hosting this event is ensuring that we do our best to create a welcoming and attractive town centre for the many visitors and tourists expected to arrive in support of these prestigious golf events. And I have no doubt that Newcastle, and I visited Newcastle some time ago and was really impressed with the work that had been carried out. And indeed, I plan uh, to be in Newcastle, I trust, very soon, in fact, possibly tomorrow morning. We have time for a quick supplementary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was almost, uh, <laughs> almost going to ask the Minister if he has any free tickets for the event, but maybe, maybe he has not. Can I say that I welcome that development, and I hope when he does visit uh, South Down in Newcastle tomorrow, he will get a chance to appraise himself of the enormous opportunities that this event will have for Newcastle and Northern Ireland generally, and hopefully, as a result of his investment, he will be able to show that um, we can regularly host these major competitions and bring a great deal of credit and good news to Northern Ireland. 
And the answer to that is no, I have no tickets for uh, the Gulf. And uh, secondly, yes, I will be in Newcastle tomorrow morning and look forward to seeing what is yet again a, a very important uh, part of our tourist infrastructure and a place that many people in Northern Ireland enjoy going to, not only during the summer but throughout the year because it's an idyllic part of our uh, not your heritage. Member, time, sir. time is up.